Hello, I'm Charlie Brooker and you're watching Election Wipe, a programme all about the campaign that's been happening. A campaign that's included things like this. The news has been calling it the most unpredictable election in decades. This election could be one of the most unpredictable in one of the most unpredictable elections. Entirely unpredictable. The most unpredictable election. Unpredictable. This is the most unpredictable election. I knew they were going to say that. In a tight contest, politicians have been targeting specific groups. Cameron went after the Sikhs while Miliband courted the Hindus. But there was an awkward moment when Cameron forgot which football team he's claimed to support since childhood and was Aston Villified. Of course, I'd rather you supported West Ham. Oh, um. <laughs> <coughs> and grave scenes for Miliband as a photo op turned into a literally monumental PR gaffe. With many predicting a hung parliament, Nick Clegg prepares to fulfil a vital role as a tough pub quiz question of the future. And biased BBC lackey Evan Davis subjected Nigel Farage to needlessly tough questions. Did you see the Paddington Bear movie last year? No. The election is incredibly close. In fact, it's tomorrow morning. But we start here. The 2015 general election campaign has lasted about a month, although it feels far longer. If you could vote to make it stop, you probably would. Actually, that's sort of what's going to happen. Before the campaign had even begun, all eyes were on Prime Minister David Cameron, who'd said this would be his last election. And things were already fractious. Critics accused him of being a chicken who was trying to avoid a live TV debate with a man he'd spent five years debating on live TV. Of course, Cameron's a dab hand at avoidance strategy, thanks to his odd habit of abruptly walking out of shop before reporters can ask any questions he might not want to answer. Right now, the key thing is getting everything done that we can in the next few hours to protect as many homes and communities as possible. Once the army's gone... OK, thank you, Prime Minister. That was... that was David Cameron there. But there was nowhere to run during Cameron versus Miliband, the battle for number 10, the desolation of Smaug, to give it its full title. Despite being billed as a kind of boxing match, the two men weren't actually going head to head. Instead, Cameron underwent a terrorising from establishment psychopath Jeremy Paxman, who opened with a characteristic ice maker. David Cameron, do you know how many food banks there were in this country when you came to power? Oh, good, it's a quiz. There were 66 when you came to power. There are now 421. Hmm, sounds bad, but on the plus side, Britain's abject desperation industry is booming. We changed the rules. The previous government didn't allow job centres to advertise the existence of food banks. They thought it would be bad PR. Yeah, they're not allowed to advertise nooses for much the same reason. Next, Silver Fox torture chamber Paxman cornered the PM on zero hours contracts, and Cameron tried to wriggle out with a zero content answer. I'm you know, saying there are 700,000 people on zero hours contracts. Could you live on one? No, I, look, some, as I said, Could some you people... Could well, uh, you have to, I want to create a country where more people have the opportunity of the full-time work that they want. Could but you live on people, a zero-hours contract? Well, look, it's not, that's not the question. The question is... Well, it's, it's the question I'm asking. Well, and Paxman won't settle for that. No, he'll smack you around the chops with an anecdote. A colleague of mine this morning spoke to a man in the North East, Patrick. He, wor he walks four hours to and from work. When he gets there, he doesn't know whether he's on for one hour or two hours, or if he's lucky, longer, and then he has to walk home again. To be fair, he does work as a shoe tester. Once Cameron was dispensed with, it was the turn of Play-Doh IT manager and Labour leader Ed Miliband. The general sense of anticipation for Miliband couldn't have been much lower. In fact, provided he didn't weep or defecate live on air, he'd be doing better than expected. To date, the most inspiring public appearance Miliband had ever made was this one earlier this year, where he was applauded for saying, Oh! 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 Stirring stuff. And even that soaring rhetoric wasn't enough to counter the general image of him as a spod and a dweeb and a weed and a nerd and a spod again. Many said it was hard to imagine him standing in front of number 10, even when they saw him standing in front of a number 10. Before meeting Paxo, he faced the public, where it quickly became apparent this was a new Miliband we were seeing, one giving off the sort of relaxed, cheerful assurance that can only be battered into you by hours of intensive coaching. He was smiling, standing casually with his legs apart and one hand in his pocket like a trendy teacher, and scuttling to his lectern and coming back out again like a robotic hoover that needs to recharge. And he didn't seem too phased when punters he couldn't locate asked him tricky questions about his brother David. Hi, over here. Oh, hi. Do you not think that your brother would have done a better job? Oh. He... Bless him, he thinks it's hilarious. It's not fair to say he stabbed his brother in the back. I mean, look, he did it to his face. But next it was time for the blood sports to commence as Paxman the Impaler came at him with a blunt instrument. Ed Miliband, do you think Britain is full? 
in terms of immigration? No, in terms of pudding. There were testy exchanges between the pair of them, although Miliband, rather than letting Paxo rip him a new one as expected, fought back, even mustering the odd zinger. You don't get to decide the election results six weeks before the general election. You're important, Jeremy, but not that important. It's the British, I don't it's want, the British I don't, people. It's the British I people. don't want to decide. No. Piqued by this, Jezzo resorted to some shaggy dog gags of his own. A bloke on the tube said to me last week, Bullshit! <coughs> Ed Miliband goes into a room with Vladimir Putin, the door is closed, two minutes later the door is opened again and Vladimir Putin is standing there smiling and Ed Miliband is all over the floor in pieces. That'd never happen. Vladimir Putin can't smile. You understand what the point is here. The point is people think you're just not tough enough. Well, uh, let, let me tell you, right? Uh, let me tell you. OK. <laughs> Come on. Let, let me tell you. Uh, oh, it's all right, Ed. They're not laughing at you. They're just laughing over you. Quick, knock them dead with a sound bite. Am I tough enough? I'm tough enough? Hell yes, I'm tough enough. Oh, God, I think I just ruptured my cringing pipes. Worse was to come, and as Miliband kept fighting his corner, Paxman readied the death blow. Newspapers can write what they like. The bloke on the tube can say what he likes. I, I don't care, because I care about the British people and what happens to them. The thing is... They see you as a North London geek. They see you as a North London geek. Wait a, minute, wait a minute, how did we get here? Surely the relationship between politicians and TV wasn't always this overtly hostile, was it? Answer, no. Way back yonder, television was seen as a novelty, a sort of high-tech variety club with little relevance to politicians who expected deferential treatment and got it. Well now, Mr Eden, with your very considerable experience of foreign affairs, it's quite obvious that I should start by asking you something about the international situation today, or perhaps you would prefer to talk about home. Which shall it be? But this cosy relationship changed when the launch of ITV heralded ITN News, which ripped up the establishment rulebook on political reporting and made a star of the abrasive Robin Day. Will you please get out of the way of my camera? In 1958, Day interviewed Prime Minister and footballer Harold Macmillan and asked him a question which seems mild by today's standards, but at the time was seen as outrageous. How do you feel, Prime Minister, about criticism which has been made in the last few days, in Conservative newspapers particularly, of Mr Selwyn Lloyd, the Foreign Secretary? It caused an outcry but set the tone for less deferential times to come. In the 1960s, the Profumo scandal tarnished the public view of politicians and the concurrent TV satire boom made them wider targets for mockery. The power balance between TV and politicians was shifting and some political figures seemed openly affronted by the change in tone. Try and turn it into a party issue. Really beyond belief contemptible. You feel that the, those who've spoken out, the bishops, the times, and so on, have tried to turn to the party? I think you have. Thank you, Lord Hill. Politicians gradually learned to accept that what you said on TV wasn't as important as the way you came across, and as a result, they became more polished. Confronted by slicker opponents, the interviewers were forced to up their game to try and unsettle them. In Robin Day's case, that meant becoming even more abrasive. But why should the public on this issue as regards the future of the Royal Navy, believe you, a transient, uh, here today, and if I may say so, gone tomorrow, politician, rather than a senior officer of many years. I'm sorry, I'm shut up. Thank you, Mr. Mott. And as interviewers got more aggressive, politicians got more evasive. I was entitled to be consulted. Did you threaten to overrule? I, him? I was not entitled to instruct Derek Lewis. And did the you truth of to overrule the, the truth of the matter is that did I did not to overrule him. I did not overrule Derek did Lewis. Did you threaten to overrule him? I took advice. As the two frustrated sides repeatedly locked horns, the relationship grew ever more competitive and sour. What on earth are you but talking me, about? Do let you me want finish. to address the question or not? Let me finish. You called me an attack dog because I've got a Glasgow accent, and I find that... It's nothing that to do with having a Glasgow accent. Well... Who's mentioned anything about a Glasgow accent? Well, Jeremy, can, we get on, can we get on to the substance? Yes, if you stop insulting people. Eventually, almost all political interviews came to resemble two people trapped in a loveless marriage bickering on their way home from a shit dinner party. I'm fed up with you telling me what I think. I don't care I what don't you're think fed up with. I don't care what you're fed up with. And this year's election coverage hasn't been any less frosty. In the real world, Andrew, where I live, OK, unlike where you live and many other people... You have no idea where I live. Just answer yeah. the question. Okay. In the real world where I live... I... London geek. And that brings us back to where we were. London geek. They see you as a North London geek. Who cares? 
Of course, MPs are used to getting a rough ride on TV, which they also will, incidentally, throughout this show, because for the sake of even-handedness, I've got to be horrible about all of them. So if I call David Cameron a boob, I have to call Ed Miliband a boob, and Nick Clegg a boob, and Nigel Farage a boob, and Natalie Bennett a boob, and Nicola Sturgeon a boob, and Leanne Wood a boob, and this kitten a boob, and myself a boob, even though I'm a prick. That's how balance works. Meanwhile, the contenders had begun heaping insults on each other as an emboldened Miliband launched the Labour campaign and took the opportunity to lay into Cameron. What did we see last night? We saw a rattled Prime Minister running from his record. Yes, and round that ragged record, the rattled rascal ran. Faced with this cockier Miliband, Cameron responded by striking a statesmanlike pose as Parliament was dissolved. I've just had an audience with Her Majesty the Queen. Yeah, well, I've just had a twix, so who's the f***ing winner here? The next Prime Minister walking through that door will be me or Ed Miliband. And having posed that cliffhanger, he then answered it by being the next Prime Minister to walk through that door. So far, the focus had been on Cameron and Miliband, but we no longer live in a two-party system or a three-party system or even a system. We may well be heading for a hung parliament, but how would that work? Well, here to make some sense of it is Philomena Kunk. Over to you, Philomena. Thank you. I'm in a sort of PlayStation House of Commons, which you can see and I can't because it's all green where I am. This election is important for politicians because if they lose, they get hung. And it's all about winning seats, which is weird because, as you can see, they're actually benches. The important bit's that white dotted finish line down there. Basically, when the votes come in, they sit in rows like a school photo until there's enough of them to go over that line. So if the Tories do brilliantly or breed and make loads of new blue flavour MPs, it might look like this. See, the benches are filling up with blue stuff, like a tenor lady pad. In this case, they've got 335s worth, which means they flood over the line and they've won Britain. But what would happen if Labour did sort of OK, but not as good as that? See, that's not enough to get them over the winning line, and apparently they're not allowed to just shuffle along, sort of spacing their bums apart along the benches, so they are over the line. Instead, they have to borrow MPs off other parties. So, say they nicked 25 Liberal Democrats. That's something, but not enough. So, they might have to get some SNP people in, like they've promised they definitely won't. And that does take them over the line, and the SNP and Lib Dem colours are so similar, they'd probably get on. The Tories and UKIP don't want that to happen, but the ones who'd be most angry are the Greens, because the benches were green to start with before all the other colours came in. So they were winning by 100%, and now they've been left with fuck all, but that's democracy. Anyway, it doesn't matter what happens in here, it's outside in Great England Kingdom where the politics actually happens. And apparently, if I do this with my arms, I'm outside now. Has it happened? Has it happened yet? Has it happened? Has it? OK. Just nod next time. So, I'm standing outside on Britain, but it's not real Britain, it's sort of jigsaw Britain. Oh, I can see it on the monitor. It's like being Godzilla or that illegal weatherman. Actually, I don't want to, I don't want to fall over the edge, I'll just take a few steps forward. Anyway, what happens next is some column tower things come up out of the ground, uh, which is exactly what happened in the 2010 election. These columns aren't really there, although it looks like they are there because I've walked behind them. So this is basically like the Matrix. It's mental. And there's also this one, which is more sort of glassy and fragile and has numbers everywhere. And as you can see, there's literally no point trying to make any sense of it. It's that complicated. Anyway, that's all with the graphics. So it's back to you, Mr Brooker, if you can hear me from wherever you are. Thank you, Philomena. Uh, well, as you can see, it's quite complex, so to help you make up your mind, there were some multi-party debates. Oh, shit, my arm. Sorry. 
seven party leaders go face to face live in the ITV Leaders Debate. The seven way ITV mega debate was essentially a colourful reboot of Borgen, presided over by Julie Etchingham, dressed in the style of someone about to extol the virtues of Oral B Pro Enamel. All the familiar suspects were present Eddie Milbank, Sea Leg, Admiral Akbar, and Davcam 2000, situated near the exit in case he felt the urge to abruptly walk out of shot as per usual. But there were also three comparatively new faces, female faces, that belonged to women. One such woman was Natalie Bennett, all the way from Sydney, representing the Green Party. Not sure how she got here from Australia. I hope she f***ing walked. We know we must take real action on climate change, the biggest threat facing us all. Other parties trade in fear, fear of immigrants, demonising people on benefits. To be fair, you just told me to be scared of weather. Then there was Leanne Wood from Plaid Cymru. Prior to the debate, as Channel 4 News ably demonstrated, Leanne Wood wasn't very well known, even amongst the population of the Welsh town of Bangor. Do you know who that is? I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a clue. Um, no. An actress? But now, here she was on primetime TV, her specialist subject mentioning Wales. Plaid Cymru can win for Wales, but we can only do that with your support. I'm asking you to support Plaid Cymru, the party of Wales, to make our communities in Wales as strong as they can be. In Wales? Please support Plaid Cymru to make Plaid Cymru Wales' voice in Westminster. And Wales? Finally, there was the SNP's nice mum from a sensible biscuit commercial, Nicola Sturgeon, a woman trapped in a forced marriage she temporarily has to pretend is tolerable. My message to people watching in England, Wales and Northern Ireland is one of friendship. Mm, the sort of friendship you treasure so much you want to annul it. Many remarked that the format resembled a game show, but it actually felt like seven game shows all happening at once, specifically Total Wipeout, Pointless, Blankety Blank, Robot Wars, Are You Smarter Than a Ten-Year-Old, The Great British Breakup and The Immigration Game. The debate certainly helped potential voters make up their minds by providing a much-needed platform in which differing political views could be aired clearly and coherently and all at the same time. No immigration. I want to come back on no, that choice. This is the second time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the second time in this debate. Can I answer this? the Syria question? Yeah, I want to come back to that. Thank you. Syria. David Cameron. Well, that settles it. One person who made a splash was Nigel Farage. One of the best bits was when Nigel Fridge pointed out how much it costs when foreign people come over here with HIV smuggled inside them. There are 7,000 diagnoses in this country every year for people who are HIV positive, which is not a good place for any of them to be, I know. But 60% of them are not British nationals. It got a sort of negative response, but I don't think he went far enough. I mean, Foreign HIV people are expensive, but I bet asylum seekers with cancer cost even more, the bastards. And that Pakistani schoolgirl who got shot in the head by the Taliban, shitload of surgery she got out of us. How much did that cost? She didn't even, she didn't even offer to pay it back. She's too busy swanning around the world giving speeches to the UN. Jammy cow. Hmm. Immigration is one of the key issues of this election. As the news has made clear, everyone's talking about it. Can you put your hand up if you think that immigration is the most important issue here? The news strives to present a balanced take on immigration at all times, which often leads to bland and uniform coverage. That's the problem with immigration reports, they all look the same. And here to prove it is generic reporter Emily Surname with every news report on immigration ever. A beef eater, afternoon tea, the White Cliffs of Dover all iconic and easy to locate in the archive. Perhaps that's why they've all come to symbolise traditional Britain. But modern Britain isn't just about what Wikipedia describes as a section of coastline composed of plates of calcium carbonate. That's why I'm walking down a busy street amongst people of varied cultural backgrounds while appearing slightly detached and talking like I'm narrating a nature programme. Immigration didn't start with these West Indian immigrants in the 1950s, but since these are the earliest pictures available, TV reports on immigration sometimes do. There's also this sort of footage which is rather edgy and bleak. So let's quickly mix through to something nice happening, although obviously it's only nice if you're not a racist. Fast forward to the present and you get this sort of thing nowadays. A niqab, a Polish shop, Chinatown, someone Welsh, a robot. 
by and large, they coexist harmoniously, but there can be tensions, tensions that can run high. These builders might have come from Eastern Europe or from Chichester. It's impossible to tell without asking them, which I don't have time to do because I'm about to mix through into an impressionistic montage overlaid with data too dull to take in. After that, shots of a man I'll pause with faint amusement before introducing Nigel Farage. This is Nigel Farage drinking a pint of beer. This is Nigel Farage drinking a pint of beer. This is Nigel Farage drinking a pint of beer. And this is Nigel Farage laughing and drinking a pint of beer. David Cameron isn't drinking a pint of beer in this shot. Instead, he's walking and looking serious. Ed Miliband seems happier in this shot, in which he also isn't drinking a pint of beer. These men are drinking a pint of beer, and this one looks more stereotypical than the other, so I'll ask his opinion. Because ultimately there's too many of them, there's just too many. I mean, we can't even be English anymore, there's no, no point. Despite my patronising nodding, not everyone agrees. Something I'm going to illustrate for balance, although I'll pick a white person to do it, so you don't think they've got a vested interest. Well, I just think anyone who talks about immigration as being blatantly racist. While some just don't know what to think. Yeah, I don't know what to think, to be honest. Whatever your views on immigration, there's no denying it's been mentioned during this campaign. And whenever it's mentioned, people are talking about it. In my case, talking without expressing any opinion, because that's balance. And once this link's finished and the camera's off, I'll find a coffee shop toilet to have a shit in and then go home. Emily's surname, election wipe, television. A lot of politicians don't want to talk about immigration until they're safely in their own car. In 2010, Gordon Brown pissed on his campaign chips by loftily dismissing a voter who'd raised the issue. She's just a sort of bigoted woman. You might not like this, but he said, what a disaster. Who, who got me to talk to that woman? She's a bigot. Or words to that effect. And we want to know your, your response to that. You're joking. Well, you think that was bad? He even did a Saki Zieg Heil as he got in his car. One politician determined to confront the issue is Nigel Farage, seen here failing to notice the TARDIS materialising in front of him. Farage has succeeded in placing immigration at the forefront of the national conversation, partly by mentioning it at every possible opportunity, like the time he said he'd been late for an event because the M4 was jammed with immigrants. Well, it took me six hours and 15 minutes in the car to get here. It should have taken three and a half to four. That's not, that, that, that has nothing to do with prof professionalism. What it does have to do with is a country in which the population is going through the roof, chiefly because of open door immigration and the fact the M4 is not as navigable as it used to be. UKIP have won over many voters who feel other parties pussyfoot around immigration thanks to political correctness. Although, of course, one drawback with unapologetically tackling that sort of topic is you're often called upon to apologise. Somewhere, somehow, somebody in UKIP has made a very major error. This is our fault. It's the party's fault. Hands up. If I gave the impression in that interview that I was discriminating and he gets Romanians, then I apologise certainly for that. UKIP leader Nigel Farage apologises in person to the Thai woman described as a ting tong by one of his MEPs. Uh, but, you know, mega, mega apologies. Love or loathe Farage, he's a character, and having character is like gold dust to politicians. That's why they go out of their way to fake it. There's a phenomenon in robotics known as the uncanny valley, the point at which a bot looks human, but not human enough to be anything other than eerie. And that effectively describes how many feel about the bulk of contemporary politicians, that there's a whiff of the bland uncanny valley about them. By comparison, Farage is full of life, quaffing a pint, guffawing, wearing his trademark coat, checking the white cliffs of Dover are still there. The combination of a big issue and a big personality has made UKIP a big deal, although their campaign hasn't always gone to plan. There were awkward poster reveals, a UKIP pledge card, which is simple and informative, but let's be frank, it's clearly too big to carry in your pocket, and there were protests, which meant on one occasion Farage had to smuggle himself into his own event, a bit like an illegal immigrant. His driver saw these people, went round the side, and Mr Farage went in that entrance. And he had to answer questions about the polls. But you know something? I'm not sure I take these polls very seriously. They're all over the shop. Yeah, but they don't call it a shop. They call it a Polsky sklep. Throughout this campaign, there was talk of a sturgeon surge, turning the SNP leader into a sort of tartan Kardashian, posing for so many selfies, she must have appeared on more phones than Doodle Jump. 
You remember Doodle Jump? This was good news for the SNP and anyone with a warehouse full of spare I Agree With Nick merchandise that had been knocking around since 2010, which could be easily updated with a minimum of effort. Yes, last time we had a general election, Nick Clegg was Nicola Sturgeon, so to speak. Back then he seemed different, refreshing. One of us, not one of them. I believe it's time to do things differently. I believe it's time for fairness in Britain. I believe it's time for promises to be kept. Hmm, should have promised to break some promises, then he'd have been fine. But then came the blunt reality of coalition and compromise, and soon the Lib Dems broke their pledge on tuition fees, a development which led to a light outbreak of rioting and much personal derision for Clegg, the only man who seems to get less attractive the more power he gets. Soon Golden Boy was on TV with a new message that sounded like a sorrowful voicemail from a remorseful ex-boyfriend. There's no easy way to say this. We made a pledge, we didn't stick to it, and for that I am sorry. You're not promising you're sorry, are you? I will never again make a pledge unless as a party we are absolutely clear about how we can keep it. Hang on, did you just promise not to make a pledge? Because my logic glands can't f***ing handle this. Anyway, fast forward to now and the Lib Dems launched their manifesto in a trendy art space. This time around it contained no rash promises, which doesn't sound very promising. They are making claims about eliminating the deficit and splashing money on the NHS, but the Lib Dems' chief pledge, OK, promise, is to provide stability. Someone is going to hold the balance of power on the 8th of May, and it won't be David Cameron or Ed Miliband, but it could be... Keira Knightley? Nigel Farage. Close enough. It could be... Mr Bump? Alex Sam. A mm, bit more likely, I suppose. Or it could be me and the Liberal Democrats. Oh. Can I have Mr Bump again? What the Lib Dems are chiefly offering is a chance to temper the other party's extremes. There'll be the blob of sour cream that cools the hot chilli, the spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down, the lube on the broom handle. Every Liberal Democrat MP makes Labour's reckless borrowing less likely. Every Liberal Democrat MP makes George Osborne's ideological cuts less likely. No likely, no likely. The Liberal Democrats will add a heart to a Conservative government and a brain to a Labour one. And a prick to either of them. The question really is whether voters will think the Lib Dem pledge to counter extremity is a tepid offer or a shrewd and useful one given the uncertain game of political pinball we're facing. And of course it depends on whether some voters can overcome their bitterness with Clegg himself. I'm a university lecturer. I've lost a lot of good students thanks to Nick Clegg. Maybe burns in hell, personally. I think you'll find as a Liberal Democrat he'll actually make hell less hot. Speaking of hot, smouldering Ed Miliband was busy drawing battle lines by announcing a clampdown on non-doms. The next Labour government will abolish the non-dom rule. Of course, one danger of clamping down on ultra-rich non-doms is the country might lose money if some of them go and live abroad like they're already pretending to. By highlighting non-doms, Miliband was trying to paint the Conservatives as a party of privileged elitists, something he probably learned to do while growing up in Primrose Hill, or at Oxford University, or the London School of Economics, or Harvard, or the Treasury. But while Labour wanted to discuss the mega-rich, the Tories were fixated on mega-death in the form of the Trident nuclear programme. Trident apparently helps keep Britain safe in the way only a terrifying arsenal of devastating nuclear warheads that could be fired in anger or error at a moment's notice can. It's kept up in Scotland, because that's closer to Moscow than London is, so if we had to nuke Russia, the missiles would have less distance to fly, which is good for the environment. I'm surprised the Greens are against it. The SNP are also against renewing Trident. They prefer to spend the money on something more useful, like a giant white flag. Labour want to keep Trident, but the Tories said Ed couldn't be trusted with it. We've already seen with Mr Miliband that he'll do anything to get into power. We saw that when he fought his own brother for the leadership. Still, a contradictory picture of Miliband was emerging from his critics. On the one hand, he was a nerdy weakling. On the other, a backstabbing ladies' man. I haven't found a villain this hard to understand since Bane from The Dark Knight Rises. But a curious thing happened. Rather than wondering whether Miliband was fit to lead, people began wondering whether he was just fit. Yes, somehow, he was blossoming into an unlikely sex symbol. I mean, he'd been used to women turning their backs on him, but now they were doing it because they wanted a selfie. Selfie! Selfie! And when fans weren't posing for Eddie Grams, they were photoshopping him into wank bank scenarios, courtesy of the Millie fandom. So at the very moment, the Tories were saying, do you really want this man to have his finger on that all-important red button? Lots of women were saying, yeah. The danger now for Diddy Cambo was that continued attacks on Miliband's character could make people see him as the leader of the nasty party, an image he'd do almost anything to neutralise. Now, bizarrely, the Prime Minister said he's taken an Easter break from campaigning today to try his hand at suckling orphan baby lambs. 
Oh, that little face. Oh, I just want to nuzzle in there for a great big cuddle as soon as he puts down that revolting lamb. Still, it's authentic. Cameron loves animals. Lambs, chickens, cows. Look, here he is meeting a load of them down his local beast mausoleum for a publicity stunt on the beam. I like the thighs because they're very juicy. You're talking about the chicken or the butcher? So is David your most famous customer? No, certainly not. There's plenty around here. Mr Clarkson, yeah. I expect, pops in from time to time, doesn't he? Yeah, but Clarkson drops by after they've shut, demanding a stake and threatening to punch an underling. Underlining his support for the animal kingdom, Big Dave C also blithely stood by as creatures were publicly barbecued at this photo op, which was meant to make him look like a regular guy until he was pictured eating a hot dog with a knife and fork. Christ, and you think that's posh? He eats crisps with a spoon. Meanwhile, George Osborne was out highlighting the economy and donning the garb of the regular working man. Osborne's almost always in high-vis these days. Look, there he goes, helping to load boxes onto a lorry. That's it, take a heavy one. Cheers, mate. Here he is in high-vis in a bottling plant. Here he is touring a building site. Here he is checking out some very important plans. Here he is operating a digger. Here he is breaking into the vault of the Hatton Garden Safe Deposit Company. Hang on a minute, I thought the Tories were quite well to do. What would they need to rob a vault for? David Cameron promised an extra £8 billion a year for the health service in England by 2020, saying the money would come from a strong economy under a Tory government. Jesus. No wonder George couldn't tell Andrew Marr how they were going to pay for that. You Trick. just found an extra £8 billion. Well, All I'm asking is, where does it come from? Well, no, you... no higher taxes, extra public spending cuts, where? Well, it's part of our balanced plan. And if you look over the last five That's years... That's not really an answer. Well, it is, actually. <laughs> About halfway through the campaign came the most exciting bit, Manifesto Week. First, Labour showed us theirs. The last Labour manifesto in 2010 showed a family enjoying a nuclear holocaust and wasn't a great success. But the 2015 offering focused on painstaking fiscal prudence with a booklet so austere it even had a front cover a bit like a Tesco Economy brand tin of tomatoes. In this topsy-turvy election, this was Labour's attempt to adopt the traditional Tory mantle of financial responsibility. And that might be a bit of an ask since, as this illuminating documentary footage makes supremely clear, both Ed Miliband and Ed Balls had served in Gordon Brown's treasury back when banks were free to swing from tars and fling their own shit around. Back then, Eddie Baby hung around behind Gordon Brown like an awkward teenage relative. Now he strutted to the stage to promise financial responsibility underpinned by his fiscal triple lock. A clear vow to protect our nation's finances. A triple lock of responsibility. Actually, that triple lock phrase seems sort of familiar. Maybe he swiped it off David Cameron, who used it back in 2007. So we propose a new triple lock on stability. Typical Labour, always borrowing. Next, it was the Tories' turn. Their manifesto resembled an insurance document, but somehow even more boring. The bacon-faced Bullingdon Borg clonked into position in front of a backdrop designed to make him look like he was trapped in an inspirational poster and promised voters a good life. The next five years are about turning the good news in our economy into a good life for you and your family. Thereby evoking visions of the charming BBC sitcom of the same name. So presumably in Cameron's Britain, you can look forward to a lifetime of scrabbling around in mud with pigs in the back of your garden while rich neighbours snoop down their noses at you. The big sexy policy announcement was a plan to give tenants in housing association properties the right to buy their homes. The next Conservative government will extend the right to buy to all housing association tenants in our country. Critics immediately claimed this would actually lead to fewer affordable homes. But look on the bright side. At the moment, only the fortunate few are rich enough to buy houses, which isn't fair. But if we end up with fewer affordable homes, then no one will be able to afford to buy houses, and that's a level playing field, which the homeless can build houses on. Cameron then finished with a little rhyme. Let us not go back to square one. Let us finish what we've begun. Oh, he's a poet and he doesn't know it, because robots can't process poetry. Anyway, despite their differences, all three of the trad parties were basically all trying to appeal to the little guy. The average schmo. Common people. Common f***ing people. F***ing people. That's who they want to represent. F***ing people. Yes, the Conservative Party. The real party of f***ing people in our country today. <laughs> the future of our country does not simply come from a few at the top. It comes from every f***ing person in our country. We can say that we will cut taxes for millions of f***ing people because that's what we've done. Not when we only reward those with the six-figure bonuses, but when we reward the hard work of every f***ing person in our country. It means we can proudly say that this is the party of f***ing people.
for millions of f***ers, not just the party of f***ers, but us, the party of f***ers. Meanwhile, the Green Party, motivated by a cynical and ugly desire to safeguard humankind's very existence, launched their manifesto at an event in Hackney. Their planet-conscious to-do list wasn't available in dead tree format. Instead, it existed online, which is far more eco-friendly, because all you need to read it then is a factory-built computer and a constant supply of electricity. The Greens are concerned that thanks to climate change, there soon might not be any clouds for them to keep their heads in, while the other parties protect their heads from environmental catastrophe by burying them in the sand. But at the Green Manifesto, event, there almost seemed to be more discussion of economy than ecology. At the heart of this manifesto is a vision of a fair economy. That fair economy demands the end to austerity. It demands that we restore and enhance the essential public services that we all, but particularly the most vulnerable, need. Fascist! The Greens clearly believe they're the goodies. One of them even looks like Bill Oddie. But it turned out their financial plans haven't been thoroughly checked out. You haven't so, actually independently so, audited these figures so at all. We have to work on the figures, no, it must be using up. our own resources and doing what we think is sensible. Yes, and some of what they think is sensible sounds like bloody good fun. Here's another vision that you've um, outlined in your manifesto, to free all caged farm animals, chickens and pigs, out of the cages, roaming around freely. That's going to kill big farm business, isn't it? Mm, maybe, but on the plus side, it's a real winner for any hens that have registered to vote. Anyway, when Channel 4's Michael Crick hit the Hackney streets, he struggled to find people impressed with the green vision. They can afford to be idealistic because, you know, they... It's easy to kind of write a manifesto that's never actually going to kind of come into practice. Right, mate. It? Jesus Christ. They think, chill out. The one thing this election didn't have enough of was debates. They're only about 60. How are you meant to make your mind up with that? The BBC did a debate, which was like the ITV one, but without Cameron and Clegg. I think they've been knocked out, so this was a bit like Judges' Houses week on X Factor, but with talking instead of singing. And instead of being in Simon Cowell's villa, it was in David Dimbleby's ballroom. What was nice was all the politicians had driven in on segways and parked them in a row. There were more women than men in the lineup, and they were all sort of left leaning, pacifisty women, which was refreshing because it meant it didn't just collapse into a load of angry shouting. The privatised a large chunk of the health. No, it's but not. This is and you're you lying, say. and you're lying. Ed, I believe it's what you say. It's going to come in now. Of... Anyway, there was this bit where Nigel Farage said something about immigrants, and Nicola Sturgeon got cross. She said there shouldn't be any difference between immigrants and emigrants, starting with the way we pronounce them. We're a nation of immigrants as well as immigrants, and we should treat immigrants the way we would want immigrants from our country to be treated wherever they go to settle. Nigel Farage was there, and because the others were sort of liberal, he was kind of isolated on a little island all of his own, which you'd think he'd love. It meant he'd have to work really hard at winning over the crowd, which was probably why he didn't bother. There just seems to be a total lack of comprehension on this panel, um, and indeed amongst this audience, which is a remarkable audience, even, even by, even by the left-wing standards of the BBC. I mean, this lot's pretty left-wing. Oh, hang on, hang on a sec. Afterwards, Farage continued to complain about left-wing bias on the BBC, and not just in that debate, but what he saw as bias on comedy shows. People think the BBC's biased, but that's only because a lot of the people who appear on it seem sort of left-leaning and they say loads of liberal things and sing liberal songs and make liberal jokes. And to be fair to the Beeb, it balances all of them out by doing a documentary starring Hitler every now and then. Meanwhile, in debate land, heartthrob Miliband was in his element amongst the women. Natalie Bennett for the Greens signalled her interest while Ed cockily rebuffed her with his face. We prepared to work with Ed on a vote-by-vote -vote basis. Then Nicola Sturgeon offered him a full relationship if he made a few changes. That's my odd offer to Ed Miliband. If he's prepared to be better than the Tories, then I'm prepared to work with him. Oh, you better shape up, cos she needs a man. And her heart is set on... I've got fundamental disagreements with you, Nicola. Oh, oh God, he's playing hard to get. Don't right. turn your back Nicola, on that Nicola. head and let David Nicola. Cameron back uh, into Downing Street. Oh, no, Nicola, look, here's the situation. It's a bit like a rom-com, this, watching a couple bicker when you just know they're going to end up in bed together. Afterwards, the world was abuzz about potential romance betwixt Ed and Nicola. Everyone loves a will-they-won't-they they story, and this was no exception. Lorraine Kelly asked Ed why he was being such a commitment phobe. Why have you ruled that out? Why do you keep saying we're not going to do it? We've got fundamental differences while Kay Burley prodded Nicola by telling her Ed's just not that into her. We heard from Mr Miliband, he made it clear that he's not interested. 
Meanwhile, stern parent David Cameron reckoned the faintest whiff of romance was bad news for everyone. It might be a match made in heaven for them, but it is a match made in hell for the British economy. The topic got camel toe so crotchety it even exacerbated his chronic walking away condition. There would be a constitutional crisis and constitutional chaos is what he said, and for once Gordon Brown was right. Where are you going? Come back and help if it's so f***ing serious. For centuries, the English and the Scottish have been friendly neighbours, apart from the occasional massacre or ingrained, indelible, deeply held grudge. But recently, that's gone a bit wonky. Last year, they had this referendum to see if Scotland should become a real country like Alaska or Westeros. The Scotland fashionalists said it was a once-in-a-lifetime, never-to-be-repeated chance, and then they lost. So now they want to do it again and again and again until everyone ticks the right box. Last year, the SNP had a man called Alex Salmon, and everyone hated him because he was so popular. So this year, Scotland sent a woman to do the elections. A few months ago, no one had even heard of her. And now suddenly everyone was saying, Nicola Sturgeon, Nicola Sturgeon, Nicola Sturgeon. 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 Anyway, she was quite smiley, but then the paper started calling her the most dangerous woman in Britain, like more dangerous than Rose West or Cheryl Cole Fernandez or whoever, the one who beat up that toilet lady. There was this calm, measured press coverage that explained the whole thing could lead to the worst crisis for Britain since the abduction of King Edward. What they'd worked out, which was really scary, was that if the SNP and Labour got more seats than the Conservatives, they could form a government and carry out their policies just because of this loophole they'd found, which is that that's how elections work. After all that talk about a clash of nations, it was time for something positive, and it came as David Cameron delivered an inspiring speech praising Britain's multicultural society. A world in which people of different races, religions, social backgrounds and sexual orientations can live in harmony while an eaten educated white millionaire tells us how great that is. But his inspiring message was somewhat drowned out by an awkward faux pas. Where you can support Man United, the Windies and Team GB all at the same time. Of course I'd rather you supported West Ham. Uh, um. <laughs> <coughs> Yes, Cameron claimed to support West Ham, whereas he used to claim to support Aston Villa. When called on it, he explained quite simply what had happened. I, I'm a Villa fan. I don't know what uh, happened to me. I must be overcome by something uh, this morning. Um, uh, but there we are. These things sometimes happen uh, when, uh, when you're... Pretending to like Aston Villa? To be fair, I suppose forgetting which football team you've claimed to follow since childhood is one of those things that just slips your mind from time to time, like what country you live in or which end of your body you shit through. Cameron's football gaffe was a rarity in what was a notably risk-averse campaign. Everything felt stiff and controlled and familiar. The leaders made like Disneyland mascots and posed with kiddiewinks or stood around pointing like finger salesmen. Ed Miliband took to standing behind a statesman-like lectern wherever he went. It was supposed to make him look outstanding in his field, even when he was just outstanding in a field. Almost all the leaders were regularly seen standing in front of sycophants holding placards like they were advertising a golf sale. But these enthusiastic space fillers are bussed in by the parties with the actual public kept at arm's length. The speech might have been at a university, but students were kept firmly outside the room. And the party publicity machines didn't appreciate the news pointing this out. Oh, how um, is this organised? It's part of society at university, so conservative future. Some our, Not allowed. Some of our young volunteers. Yeah, there's uh, young, young volunteers and um, we've asked them not to speak to the media. Oh, wh why is that? Yeah. I say we're not talking to the media. But you, 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 you're here with your placards okay, and on, giving on, visual on, support. Nigel Farage was one of the few leaders regularly pictured out and about actually meeting the public. That's because he's a man of the people, provided they're already here. Maybe the public were kept away from the others in case they embarrassed them, as they sometimes tend to do. For instance, here we see Labour's Tristram Hunt meeting a young future voter. Uh, do you know who you'd vote for? Ah, uh, UKIP. You'd vote UKIP? Very good. Why is that? Uh, like get all the phones out of country. Meanwhile, David Cameron got melodically abused by a ukulele toting class warrior. Journalists too generated several awkward moments. You're standing in front of a placard that says ban exploitative zero hour contracts at an event set up by people who are on zero hour contracts. Aren't you the hypocrite? 
I think we, um... But most of the time, everything was corralled and contained. It all led to complaints that the campaign was tired and boring. Cameron, in particular, came in for criticism, with some people saying he didn't seem hungry enough. So you know what he did? He rolled his bally sleeves up and he fought back and turned the air blue. And I want you to take that argument that Labour make and stick it where the sun don't shine. Yes, Cameron had been rebooted with the control key held down and now he was reinvigorated and a bit pink. And if I'm getting lively about it, it's because I feel bloody lively about it. That's the rule. Yes. Steady on, Dave. Taking a having a having a that pumps me up and it's what our country. Prime Minister, I feel like we're seeing your feistier side. Is this your yes response to critics who say you've not been passionate enough? I just say it as I see it. And I really feel passionate about this election. We've come so far. Hmm, he's certainly showing them some spunk. These supporters were lapping up this pumped up Prime Minister. Meanwhile, eyebrows were raised when a radical millionaire lady killer who's convinced many not to bother voting at all met Russell Brand. Just like one of Russell Brand's movies, this. Get him to the geek. Sitting in Russell's one opulent kitchen with a tap so huge it looks like a piece of machinery from a milking shed, the two men crossed swords. Brand established his credentials by claiming little meaningful change had happened since women got the vote back in 1928. Since then, since suffrage, since the right of women to vote, what has meaningfully occurred? <laughs> That's totally wrong. Go on, mate. Well, look, workers' rights, the National Health Service, a minimum wage. Yeah, but apart from that and seeing us through World War II, what else? Miliband stood up for little political guys like him against the big brand name, employing odd gestures and weird hand moves to underline his points. And it soon became apparent that Russell was rubbing off on Miliband, not like that, but in the way he started dropping his T's and saying, God of this. First of all, you've got to do it internationally. Yeah. A God of that. And that is hard yards, but you've got to do it. It was God of awful. But it seemed Miliband had won Russell over. I think the fundamental problem with this country is that people think it's run for somebody else, and the somebody else is probably somebody right at the top of society. They've got the access, the influence, the power, and it's not run for them. And that's what we've got to change. That is exactly it. That is exactly it. Sounds like he's won that vote you don't believe in. But David Cameron didn't seem very impressed. Russell Brand's a joke. Right? Ed Miliband, hang out with Russell Brand. He's a joke. This is not funny. I haven't got time to hang out with Russell Brand. This is more important. These are real people. Yes, Campbell Plops doesn't have time to hang out with Russell Brand. He's busy fielding questions from real people, like the real people he met in this enlightening interview for Heat magazine. So, first up, there's a young man called Joey Essex. Hi, David. It's Joey Essex here. What are you saying? Um, I just want to ask you a quick question. If you had to be an animal for the day, or for a lifetime, what would you be and why? Question mark. Uh, I think you ought to be something at the top of the food chain, I guess. What, like a human being? Dave also took questions from Alan Carr. What's your day? It's Alan Carr here. And Charlotte off Geordie Shaw, who was having a shit. Oh, hi, Dave. Sorry you've caught us at a really awkward time. We're just on the toilet. Oh, I'd give that question ten minutes if I were you. Steph and Dom from Gogglebox. I love them. Hi. Hi there. Stephen Dom here from Goldbox, and this is our question for the Prime Minister, David Cameron. <laughs> Afterwards, Russell Brand made a glaring U-turn, endorsing first the Greens, then Labour, albeit a bit too late for any fans who'd torn up their voter registration cards for his approval. But what if everyone tore up their cards and nobody voted for anyone? What would that look like? The latest recount confirms no votes have been cast in this year's general election, leaving Russell Brand the default winner. Where is this called? Let me spread harmony. This is harmony in her mate faith and hope. Hi. I'm going to take him for a Cobra meeting if you catch the insinuation. Hare Krishna! Promise we can give her the NHS! Brand immediately appoints his cabinet. Kate Moss becomes Chancellor. Noel Fielding is Foreign Secretary while the Minister for Culture is a photograph of Noam Chomsky stuck to the end of a broom. Britain's former MPs are settling into their new careers. What? Ed Miliband is now a delivery boy, while George Osborne works in a garden centre. But Brand's unconventional shake-up is only just beginning. Prime Minister Brand today closed the London Stock Exchange and abolished money. We're no longer mentally caged by these capitalist sick notes, these illusory IOUs, these paper shits. Well, obviously, the abolition of money changed the face of the city. Banks shut down, buildings stood completely abandoned, and without financial workers keeping the concrete dry by walking back and forth from their desks to sandwich shops and so on, the city quickly began to return to its natural state. 
Within a week, there was ivy completely covering the exterior of the gherkin, gazelles grazing on the former floor of the stock exchange. It was really all quite serene if you ignored the massive food riots taking place the length and breadth of the country. There seems to be no end to this rioting. And of course, there's nothing in the shops, which is making the looters particularly angry. As Britain burns, Prime Minister Brand is otherwise engaged doing a press junket for Get Him to the Greek too. An odyssey, if you will. No Britain's on fire. What's that, mate? His promotional obligations complete, Brand heroically insists on watching footage of the rioters. Oh, that is beautiful. Inspired by their energy, he decides to join in. Brand! The rioting continues unabated for another 72 days. 89% of the country is in ruins. Desperate officials arrange for a state visit from Vladimir Putin, who is offering the UK a bailout deal in exchange for leaving NATO and establishing a Soviet missile base. I'm gonna go in there and appeal to him on a human level, see what his face does. Prime Minister! 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 Disaster strikes five minutes into the negotiations when Brand has sex with Putin's 23-year-old granddaughter in a corner of the room. Within hours, Putin flies home and orders an all-out nuclear attack on Great Britain. As missiles race towards a defenseless UK, Prime Minister Brand delivers a final address to the nation. Obviously, this nuclear attack ain't ideal. And I'm sorry that your kids are gonna burn to death in your arms and all that, but on the other hand, reality is just a construct. So don't think of it as losing your existence, but gaining the ultimate freedom. Sayonara, peace out. As the first warhead detonates over central London, the initial blast is drowned out by a collective sigh of relief from the population below. And then Brands Britain is destroyed. TV loves to poke a mic at people and ask them what they think, although the results aren't always encouraging. For one thing, you sometimes get people who just don't care. Personally, I don't really vote anymore. <laughs> to be honest, I don't really vote. I know nothing about politics. Completely wrong person to be asking about that. OK, who are you going to vote for? <laughs> uh, probably UK. Or don't know much. I don't fancy in charge of the... The, so the Labour Party, yes. The... Who's in charge of the at the moment? No, that's George, George, George Osborne. Osborne. Which party is he? Or don't know anything. Do you think manifestos are important these days, or do you think that people already know what's going to happen? I really happen? haven't got a clue what a manifesto is. <laughs> or you get people who hate all politicians. When I hear any politician's name, all that goes through my mind is rip off. Or you get people who don't make sense. My buttocks are smooth, my mind is clear. Vote your trip. During the campaign, we have been hearing from voters across the UK who've been telling us what's important to them. Tonight, the views of a Manchester taxi driver. When TV's not out vox popping, it's patronising people by making a little film all about what they think, thereby gaining a crucial insight into the real issues facing our nation. Potholes, they're a real big problem. I drive and I'm concentrating on missing a pothole. I don't want to ruin one of my tyres or do something to my suspension. So we need to sort the roads out, we need to sort the potholes out. The thoughts of Steve Raiden there in Manchester. So far, the main leaders have chiefly been surrounded by supporters or celebrities. Basically, they've had less contact with the public than that nurse who got Ebola. But the last live TV event pitted them against a whole room full of public. And it turned out the public flipping ate them. First, Aston Villa denialist Cameron met a fan. I'm sorry, but I just think you're either deceiving the British public or you know exactly what you're going to do, but you're refusing to give specifics. As the event went on, he started to perspire. Jesus Christ, he's sweating so much, he looks like he's laminated. Next, besuited woodland creature Ed Miliband tried to win the crowd over by adapting his uh catchphrase into the much shorter woo. <laughs> Stirring stuff. Under sustained hostile questioning, he gave this provocative answer. Do you accept that when Labour was last in power, it overspent? No, I don't. Uh, and I know you may not agree with that. Still, at least it couldn't get any worse until it did. And finally, Nick Clegg took the biggest faceful since your mum. Wondered if you've got plans for a new job after next week when you become unemployed and your party becomes an irrelevance. Charming. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> Democracy is clearly all the rage right now, but what is democracy anyway? Well, here to examine it is Philomena Kunk with one of her moments of wonder. All 
of nature, apart from maybe daisies and waterfalls, is a brutal struggle for power. These horse monster things are using their wooden head sticks in a primal battle to decide which of them should be in charge. The winner will become king of the herd. The other will probably have to leave and find work as a different sort of animal. Unlike animals, we don't have to fight to decide who's in charge. Instead, we do a vote. A vote that would be pointless without something called democracy. Democracy was invented in ancient Greece by the ancient Greeks, probably after a vote. It's hard to imagine that this was the beginning of democracy. So to help you imagine, we've got two actors in expensive costumes and some other people in trainers and sheets slightly out of focus. Just like other Greek inventions like thick yogurt, sodomy and triangles, democracy has taken the world by storm. Someone who didn't agree with democracy was Adolf Hitler. Hitler didn't have much to do with democracy at all, but people do like watching documentaries about Hitler, so we've put him in, which is democratic, which he'd hate. British democracy began in Knights in Armour times here at Runnymede, which sounds worse than it is. Britain used to be ruled by a king or queen, just like now, except back then they were treated like a god, rather than a slightly better version of someone off made in Chelsea. Royal behaviour was total shithouse, until eventually the people rose up and made King John sign the Magna Carta. According to Google Translate, Magna Carta is Latin for cardboard volcano. It was a sort of contract that granted everyone in Britain a democratic voice. Soon, Britain had its own parliament, which could stop the king doing what he wanted by a simple process of cutting his head off. Parliament remains here to this day, in one of the world's most iconic buildings, Big Ben House. To find out more about democracy, I've got an expert here with me. Hello, who are you? I'm Robert Hazel, and I'm Professor of Government and the Constitution at University College London. What makes democracy a better way to pick a Prime Minister than just letting them take turns? I'm not sure how this alternative system would work, where you say, we let them take turns. Well, if, like, one does, like, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then another Thursday, Friday, Saturday... And suppose we were running a company. Would you allow any stranger to be in charge of it for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then a different person to be in charge Thursday, Friday, Saturday? That's not a sensible way to go about anything. What would happen if we voted to end democracy? How would we do that? We'd take a vote. And what would the vote say? I vote to end democracy. And what would we put in its place? Don't know. Well, it wouldn't be a very sensible thing to end one system of government without knowing what system of government you're going to replace it with. It's like saying, let's vote to leave our house without knowing where we're going to go and live next. No one's going to do that. I bet you are terrible to go on holiday with. Election day is your chance to do democracy. You don't have to stand up and be counted. You can sit down and be ignored if you like. Because that's your democratic right. You can choose not to matter. And that matters if you want it to. It's up to you. Next time on Moments of Wonder, I'll be finding out how to get the noise out of plates. Well, that's all we've got time for. Vote or don't. Until next time we meet, go away.